So, uh, for this talk, I have no disclosures, and uh, it's a great honor to come back to visit with uh, Dr. Borahol, Dr. Macarelli, and the group here at what is now a named heart Center at the Kansas City, uh, you know, sort of Central America. This is great. Thank you so much for the invitation. I was given an opportunity here to present to you data that we've accumulated pretty much over the past decade, and also to take this to the next level, which is now what electrophysiologists do beyond uh, dealing with just the standard paradigm of captivation based arrhythmias. This is one of my favorite pictures. This comes from a famous Italian painter. Uh, for some of you interested in the history of medicine, you have seen that this actually deals with uh, some of the best anatomic representations that were used in medical schools at that time. The part of this image that always catches our attention is the fact that you see all of the nerves so well depicted in the surface of the heart, and our presentation today is going to be dealing with those structures. So, I was asked to address electrical storm. So, this is a slide that I'd like to spend a few minutes on. What do we do when we deal with electrical storm? You've heard this morning about uh, ICDs and how they are programmed. The very first thing to do when you're dealing with electrical storm is to reprogram the devices. There is a lot of practical points over here, which is you can change detection times, make sure that people don't get even more shocks than they need to. That is the first and most important aspect, uh, especially in patients who have devices. Of course, the patients who come with strong who don't have devices. The second issue is common things are always common. So if you're dealing with uh, significant myocardial ischemia, I think it's important to assess the need for revascularization. Uh, things like intraorbital pumping, that is uh, to be addressed immediately. Then comes medical therapy. And the mainstay of managing this is beta blockers, and of course, amiodarone has been used very widely in this setting. Again, with very little data, and we'll never have perfect data in this field either. Then comes a set of interventions which, of course, when you talk to the most more experienced clinicians, they will always point this out. Deep sedation, intubation of patients with induced general anesthesia, and also move therapies to the next level, which is to use interventions such as thoracic epidural anesthesia and removal of the stellar ganglion. These become very important. Now, I place cancer ablation over here because it is obviously an important part of managing PTPF storms, especially if there is a structural component or if there is a monomorphic component that is actually driving this problem. We will allude to that for sure in this talk, but the focus of this talk is going to be holistic and to deal with the big picture. So, let's talk about the United States modulation of, uh, you know, the ventricular tachycardia and myocardial excitability. It would be worth talking a little bit about normal physiology. We'll talk about autonomic regulation of PT circuits, and then we'll talk about how you can actually use this to therapeutic advantage. So, what about the neural control of the heart? We can spend an entire week over here discussing about how important it is. But all we can tell you is anatomy and pathophysiology of neural regulation of the heart is incredibly important in not just our field, but also in the field of surgery and transplantation. And as it turns out, it may have one of the most important sort of controlling uh, intervenable aspects of cardiovascular function. And this is, of course, incredibly important, as you probably heard, for, for atrial arrhythmias, and uh, we'll talk about ventricular arrhythmias. This is a statement which is unchallenged in all of cardiovascular medicine, which is almost all cardiovascular functions are exclusively modulated by the autonomic nervous system. Now, let's talk about sympathetic control, which is the part of the autonomic nervous system which we partially understand. Parasympathetic regulation is even more complex, and it's only now that we are beginning to understand how it works. So let's talk about uh, how sympathetic regulation works. Sympathetic fibers that reach the heart 
course, uh, from the highest sentence, uh, reach down and you access into the spinal cord. And from the spinal cord, you have uh, efferents that reach the ganglia, which is part of the ganglia that is organ. It has ganglia that uh, have presynaptic fibers that come from the spinal cord. And from the ganglia, these fibers reach the organ of interest, of course, the cardiac efferents transit through thoracic T1 to T4. And of course, the superior part of the thoracic, uh, the T1 region is the standard ganglia on either side. So these vaccinations, fortunately, are an important anatomic target, mainly because it is something that we can actually do physically intervene on if we have to um, deal with characteristics. The fibers from these ganglia go to the heart, and it's neurotransmitter where it reaches the myocyte interface is not at where it powerfully affects excitability, chronotropy, lucidotropy, dromotropy, inotropy, all cardiac functions are related by these neurotransmitters. Now, the body also has built-in backup systems. So the backup system for mammals. Um, and mind you, uh, autonomic nervous system and autonomic signaling is preserved uh, across various life forms. And in fact, even plants have autonomic neurotransmission and energy neurotransmission. So, just to tell you how certain things are conserved in nature. So, what does the spinal cord do for circulating chemicals? The concept is exactly the same. Efferents from the spinal cord reach the adrenal medulla. And the adrenal medulla releases is pretty much a huge bag of reservoir of catcalls. It, it secretes two types of catcalls. Two thirds of it is epinephrine and a third of it is not epinephrine. So that's why even if it's sort of denervated, you still have adrenergic signaling from circulating catcalls. And of course, the same uh, efferents also control blood vessels. Now, let's talk a little bit about anatomy. So with these are some anatomic dissections, and these come from classic studies by the University of Kawashima. And when you look at some of these dissections, you see how intricate and how complex and how delicate some of these nerves are. So these are dissections showing you the nerve fibers coming out of the spinal cord, entering the ganglia, and from the ganglia reaching the heart. This is the Okay. So this particular slide here is a where color has been superimposed on the same structure that we saw in the previous slide. So this is of course if you look at something like this, it's incredibly complex for us to make sense of it. But if you were to make this color coded in a way, you'll see that two sets of fibers reach the heart, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And as it gets closer to the heart, right here, you can see that they form the cardiac plexus. So in other words, both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers run together. And they form this intricate plexus that is right behind the heart. And we are now beginning to understand its role in atrial arrhythmogenesis. And the point to be made over here is this cardiac plexus has <coughs> post ganglionic sympathetic fibers, but it has pre ganglionic parasympathetic fibers. So most of the ganglia for the parasympathetic nervous system at least sits in the heart. But as the sympathetic ganglia sits at the paraspinal regions. So that's an important point of distinction. Because to truly parasympathetic to generate the heart, our gift of the ganglia is going to be very hard. Why is it important? Because if you destroy just pre ganglionic fibers, Post-ganglionic signaling is still intact, and pre-ganglionic fibers can actually bleed through. Whereas if you take out the ganglion, post-ganglionic fibers simply cannot bleed through that well. So we're, we're going to talk about that a little more, because that's fortunately one reason why we're able to actually uh, even uh, regulate the heart or deal with the sympathetic nervous system. So this is a, a little more user-friendly image showing you the same concept. Sympathetic parasympathetic fibers, and then you actually have the plexus, which has a mixture of both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers that reach the heart. Why is all this important? So, the big picture is as follows it doesn't matter what 
uh, heart problem uh, or disease that affects the heart. Uh, the classic condition that we only talk about is myocardial infarction. This could be myocardial inflammation. Any disease that leaves behind an electrical footprint in the heart as a scar sets the stage for myocardial remodeling. And myocardial remodeling is also associated with neural remodeling of the heart. So what happens over here is the heart tries to compensate for the loss of myocytes. And in doing so, there is an intense activation of the circulating renal antigen system. So the cytokine system participates and more importantly, cardiac accidents actually go to the brain, which is pretty much the way in which sympathetic output throughout the neural axis increases in response to cardiac injury. So once this happens, of course, you can see uh, the entire process of remodeling starts. It's a compensatory process, and of course, when it goes beyond the level of compensation, you now have heart failure. And the two previous problems that we feel face in the field of cardiovascular medicine, which is heart failure and arrhythmias, are tightly linked because of this. So, scar biology is very central to all of cardiovascular medicine, uh, be it regenerative medicine and all the way to electrophysiology. Scar due to any disease process sets the stage for both heart failure and sudden death. So let's look at what it does closely. Here is a, uh, uh, this is a patient on the factor patient, but here is a merged image of a voltage map and a um, uh, CT scan. And when you look at some of these scars very closely, so the area is shown in the gray over here, and this type of electronomic mapping system is scar, then scar areas of a voltage less than 0.5 uh, millivolts. And when you look deep within these scars, you actually find small islands of surviving myocytes and strands, which set the stage for slow electrical conduction so that you get monomorphic tachycardias, which is seen over here. This is monomorphic tachycardia. And here you can see this is the ablation catheter sitting deep within the scar. You can almost see continuous activation of the vascular of course. Most of us very lucky to be very prone to see this because we know that you're going to be able to eliminate this VT like creating a controlled RF lesion in that particular way. Now, scars uh, and especially the myofibroblasts, when uh, they come in close proximity to normal myocardium, have very interesting electrical behavior. As seen here, and this of course was a concept, this was originally shown by Dr. Natami and Dr. Schweiger, who's here with us which is uh, that scar border zones actually are also rich sources of PVCs that can cause not VT, but VF. So this is myocardioplast myocyte interaction interface, which gives rise to VT, VF. Now, both these processes, of course, are very powerfully regulated by the autonomic nervous system. So this is the structural basis for arrhythmias. What makes all this more likely and what makes this even worse is what happens with adrenergic modulation. Why so? So here's a set of uh, heart images that was given to me by Mike Fishbein, who's our chief of cardiac pathology at UCLA. And Mike Fishbein here has uh, stained the scarred border zones. Uh, shown over here in this top panel, the cross section, you can see the scar, normal myocardium, and when you look at the scar border zone, this area tends to be quite interesting. So this is scar, this is normal myocardium. So when you look at scar, normal myocardium, when you look at that particular area closely and you stain for nerve uh, transmitters, neurotransmitters, you find that there's actually nerve sprouts. So nerves are trying to regrow into the scar. And the borders of the scar tend to actually have a higher density of nerves as a graduated process. And this, of course, nerve sprouting has become very important because we think it affects, uh, you know, the likelihood of arrhythmias and affects myocardial excitability. So this is again another um, the gross specimen that we just have to talk about. This is a patient who actually underwent cancer ablation of BT, and four years after the ablation, the patient actually had a transplant. So these are very valuable parts for us because we can actually protect. The heart that we ablated, and also understanding how scars are structured. So, in this particular case, you can see that this is relatively normal myocardium. Here, you have a thin, large, stretched scar, 
And of course, as far as the region where you have any extra production will be empty. So how do you put all this together? So this is where uh, Zipes um, and it was a key investigator in the field have spent the greater part of their career studying. So how do Europeans occur? Uh, especially one that you're deeply concerned about, which is the ones who use the sun there. So the concept is whatever injury that you have, in this case myocardial infarction, it could be myocarditis of the scar, sets the stage for hyperinnervation and alterations of the level of the heart. You can see that in this particular example, we also say hypercholesterolemia, and that's quite interesting because even in the absence of the scar, the mere presence of the metabolic syndrome at pro inflammatory stage sets the stage for hyperinnervation and nerve sparks in the heart. Now, no matter what causes this, once you actually have a heterogeneous increase in sympathetic nerve density, you now have non uniform effects on the myocardium. So, for a given sympathetic stimulus, different regions respond differently. And of course, uh, let's say you have an acute uncomfortable, um, uh, such as a myocardial infarction. In the presence of such heterogeneity in sympathetic innovation, you actually can develop a serious hyperlipidemia, which is the proximate cause of sudden death. And this has been seen in monitored settings. So if you were to put together this story, uh, it would be as follows. Uh, Sudden death and uh, you know serious and very portion is most acute form in the present as BPT as well depends on both a heterogeneity in the substrate because of connected nerve structure of the remodeling. On top of it, the nervous system actually undergoes a lot of remodeling and disease, which is the dynamic modulation. And these two factors together set the same for sudden cardiac death. And when you look at all the interventions that have actually reduced the risk of sudden death, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, for the heart failure literature, aldosterone attacks, tablets, CRT, they all have been shown to have very important anti sympathetic, uh, anti adrenergic effects. So, now let's talk a little bit about cognitive reduction of BT symptoms and how we could modulate that for clinical benefit. So, sympathetic tone powerfully influences BT induced living, sustainability, and degeneration. Yeah. We all know this. When we do a BT study, we don't induce the rhythmia, we try to give isoprol. So, we also know that the interruption of the autonomic nervous system at many levels tends to reduce BT and DF. And of course, this is shown in animal models, and recently we also have very good uh, initial human data to support this. So, what about autonomic regulation? So it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with focal VM, micro VM, VM, or if you're dealing purely with functional VT and VF. In all these conditions, the autonomic nervous system plays an important role. And it's worth remembering that sometimes if you're not able to control the substrate very effectively, which is the heart itself, it's worth thinking of going to the higher level, which is one level up, which is the neuromodulation part. So, what is the basis of neuromodulation? That comes from the book of this gentleman, Peter Schwartz, who, in a series of studies, initially at the University of Oklahoma, but subsequently in uh, Italy, went on to show, initially in a dog model, we'll show you actually some data from a dog model where you actually have dogs which are exercised and subject to coronary occlusion. And you can see that on coronary occlusion, the dog goes into the end. Now, Peter was able to sort of take these studies and show that if you remove the stellar ganglia, you can actually reduce uh, the likelihood of this particular if you have to. So that set the stage in the early studies of removing the stellar ganglia and autonomic modulation to be applied for arrhythmias. Now in the early part of the 20th century, it was actually used to treat angina. In fact, that was the very first use of this procedure that was done almost 100 years ago. But of course, when other things in medicine, it went out of style, and then it was, of course, discovered again. Now, we ask the question, what would happen when the heart is generated? So, here we have some data, and that is, this is a data that was published a few years ago by a farmer, who is now our newest faculty member at the Pan-Africanian Center. And what uh, Marmar and Nicholas Lelouch, who is now in Paris, they 
looked at the entire experience of UCLA, which um, at that point was the largest transplant experience in the world. And here's a classic patient whose patient was um, uh, had treadmill testing post transplant, and it was a drum player of treadmills. And CPR was started, and this was in my colleague from Ashutosh's office. We were transporting this patient, undergoing CPR from the office to the cat lab. And of course, the very first injection showed the near total occlusion of that brain. But what really got our attention, what was quite fascinating, was the fact that the rhythm here was PEA, the last PF, applies in the face of traditional wisdom that if you have coronary occlusion, you usually have PF, but this was PEA. And of course, when we looked at this data more carefully in our study, this is the finding that Marmar and Muda interestingly showed to us, and that is um, there were 35 percent of deaths were classified as sudden. And when you looked at these sudden deaths very carefully, the incidence of attack arrhythmia, which is truly VF, was uncommon. The predominant rhythm was even basically of VA. So that's a pretty uh, intriguing finding shown in a bar graph in these two slides is the fact that when you actually have a clear document of the type of death, these are still being more common than we have. And in those patients in whom we knew that it was a key distinction, like the image I showed you, that the coronary artery was included right in front of your eye or it was going to spasm on the cathode table. This is again the point of the common the common students that we saw were ACC and PA therapy rare. So that's tells you something about the fact that the nerves probably are very important for the process of population, so it's not just a myocyte these sources. So now let's turn the chapter the next level, which is how do you modulate this? So levels of modulation are fairly straightforward. You can actually deal with the higher levels of your axis. And this is precisely what we do when we integrate the patient, sedate the patient, almost in use general anesthesia. So that's a form of neuromodulation. That is the high levels of neuraxis. It's established principles of managing PPPF stock. Now, what about the next level of the neuraxis, which is at the thoracic spinal cord level? The way we would go about doing that, the potential be two approaches. One involves actual stimulation of these pre ganglionic nerve fibers. Now, nerve fibers show some interesting physiologic behavior. If you keep stimulating them rapidly enough, you actually reach a point where it ends up being an inhibitory impulse. And so spinal cord stimulation presynaptically can actually reduce synthetic output to the heart. And that has been shown very nicely in animal bodies. This is data from uh, the Zyxis group, but there have been a couple of other groups that have also done the data these studies where thoracic spinal cord uh, stimulation reduces the risk of pneumonia. And in fact, in their particular animal study, we look at this data, they actually show that when we simply the animals to ischemia with spinal cord stimulation, they tend to have a much lower incidence of natural factor So this is clear, um, high quality proof. Now, what about modulation at the same level by using pharmacologic approaches? That's where thoracic epidural anesthesia and perhaps even intrafetal use of chronology come into play. So you can ask actually work on the cord itself or the fibers that come out of the cord. So what is the uh, data for that? This is again data from the scientists group showing intrafetal chronology can reduce the incidence of uh, arrhythmias, especially the ones that are provoked by the fiber ischemia. Again, they use the King and Fusion Park model. How does this work? It's a mystery in medicine. We still don't fully really understand, but these are all the potential mechanisms that people have talked about. Decrease in synthetic tone, change in blood tone, change in relief, enhancement of the tone. But it's not fully understood yet. Now, we also advanced this a little bit in many years ago. What chief of cardiac anesthesia of the Mahajan actually helped us. And a patient was transferred to our center for capture patient for BTBS uh, stall. And this patient was so unstable that we couldn't move this patient initially from the head attack to the CCU. 
And from the CCU, we simply couldn't even move the patient out of the bed because the patient was getting so many shots. And our machine is patient, the patient was intubated almost, you know, induced coma, uh, was still having the shock. And what was done in that particular setting was, of course, this patient was doing this, and, uh, you know, this was bearing up the nurses, and this patient had received hundreds of shots. So what was done out of sheer um, desperation and also conceptually it should have worked was to use a um, thoracic epidural catheter to induce anesthesia and this is of course the data from the index case. So here it is a plot of time and number of shots and you can see this. This patient was having escalating dizziness and was fully expected to die at extreme vascular disease and not even put it up a little pump. This was before Impanel and other devices were even approved. And our shared respiration we initiated massive material anesthesia and it worked. The patient then was stable enough for the next 24 hours to be taken to the cath lab for ablation. And this particular slide here actually shows you the epidural catheter uh, at the level of T1, T2, and that is contrast to the epidural catheter to show you where it is located. Now, this of course um, uh, was one of the reasons why you have a class 2 D indication uh, in the dialysis for managing sexual arrhythmias and preventing sudden death in the presence of the GTF stock. So, let's talk about ganglionic modulation. Ganglionic modulation is uh, another mixed level of modulating the new axis. And of course, uh, we talk about how the pre ganglionic fibers from the spinal cord come over there and post ganglionic fibers project to the heart. So the right and the left step is ganglion. How do you modulate this? There's good data um, uh, of temporary modulation and this is data that comes from the Nandaman Institute at USC um, from our part of the country where they took a set of patients who came with a BPDF stop and at that time they treated them not by using standard ACLS but they actually used what seemed to be counterintuitive at that time, which is to use beta blockers and to use a uh, temporary block of the stellate ganglion. And essentially what it is, is this slide is somewhat dizzy, but to tell you that not ACL is given treatment, the patient actually did a lot better. Survival was much, much higher uh, in patients at one year. If they were treated against ACL as guidelines, but they were treated with beta blockers. And in fact, if you look at the data more carefully, here's a little uh, slide that shows in one of the patients what happens to BPBF episodes. They try antiretinic lidocaine, uh, uh, retinol, none of these drugs work. Whereas when they use a local anesthetic through a needle on the static ganglion itself, that controls the BT. And of course, when the block, which is of course, if you just use a local anesthetic, it wears out. When it bears out, the patient actually had shocks again and had to be given another dose of stellar uh, ganglion blocking using uh, local anesthetic, the patient did well. So it was pretty fascinating. In their particular study, beta blockers and temporary mix stellar ganglion block had a very powerful positive effect. So our group, of course, uh, was already intrigued by this, and since uh, for a period of time in the middle part of this decade, we actually were doing more BT ablations than AI ablations. Uh, we thought we'd ask what happens in BTPF stall. And here is data that we combined. Uh, really, this was a global study. It was included uh, two centers uh, in India, and now we also have a center in Italy where we are collecting this data for relaxing modulation. And in this study, which was published last year, uh, Tara Burke, who's our graduating EP panel, published this. She's going to be at the Canada Hansen Institute. Tara put together this data very carefully looking at the effect of thoracic epidural anesthesia and surgical that and sympathetic renovation. And what uh, essentially the procedure is as follows this is a video thoracoscopic image of the sympathetic ganglion fibers. And you can see that this is, comes off the spinal cord and this is the removed part of the cell. And during the procedure, of course, you also have to do um, a frozen section uh, stain to make sure that you actually remove the neural tissue. So, this is a sympathetic chain that is removed. And thoracic epidural is done in the standard way where the catheter is placed in the spinal cord and the uh, thoracic and anesthesiologist uh, infuse the 
testing agent. So in this study, so this was the effect of enhancing epidemiological on this slide, we can see that the number of therapies before and after PEA was dramatic. And this was the beginning changing. But of course, um, these patients were the sickest of the sick. And when we looked at both the effect of thoracic epidural and the practice of the patient, some of these patients had thoracic epidural stabilized, and then they actually had surgical model of the stellar in the next day or two. Once they were stable enough to go to the OR, and the surgery was available. So when we looked at the combined data, we were able to see that you know the effect of this intervention was uh, ranged from 60 to 100 percent efficacy in having meaningful effect in the clinical setting. And of course, we uh, extended this to the next level, which is why not just uh, take out the other standard to do that room for it. Let me actually walk you through another patient here. This is a part of a paper that's now on the review. It's actually been revised. And this is a patient who came in with BPPF stall. This patient, um, I'm going to show you a month of this patient's life. And this patient spent this entire month at our hospital. This patient was referred to us for incessant BP underwent catheterization. Did well for the first 24 hours, um, almost 36 hours, I would say. And after that, again, started having BT. It was a different type of a model for a particular BT. So the patient underwent a second BT ablation. And that again held for about 36 to 48 hours. And the patient started having BT again. And then the patient was placed on Esmolol and neoprotamol, <coughs> intubated in almost an entire anesthesia was receiving multiple shocks. So, and this goes on and on. And, and you can see that this patient continues to be in the hospital, was having multiple shocks every day. And out of sheer desperation, uh, the patient was taken up for a third ablation attempt because a third type of physical PT was seen. And even that really didn't have an effect. The patient, of course, then, by then required uh, balloon pump support, uh, and it was again with multiple cardiologists, and this is another situation where we instituted thoracic epidural anesthesia. And thoracic epidural anesthesia is not that easy to titrate. And this was one of those cases where thoracic epidural did not have a um, desirable or a complete effect. And of course, um, we said, fine, now we're going to do a surgical mode of the next step, which is done here which is done on day 28. And sure enough, that didn't completely control the problem either. And at that time, we made a decision that the patient was now extremely vulnerable to the to die. And uh, we had had the conference, got the surgeons together, and I said, why don't you go ahead and remove the right skeleton? And sure enough, out of the right skeleton was removed. This patient had complete suppression uh, of uh, even PVCs. And the patient, a week later, uh, was walking around in the hospital, refused to have an ICD, and uh, now in his three months follow-up is doing incredibly well and he has normalized. Now, we put together this data on a series of patients, which is what uh, uh, was in the manuscript, and now we have a series of eight patients in whom we've done bilateral stomach ganglionectomy, and this is the effect of bilateral stomach ganglionectomy. So many of these patients already had implanted devices, but an important finding from the study was we didn't see any major effects on electrocardiographic intervals when this was done. And these patients are all doing well. So that completes the story on ganglionic modulation. Parasympathetic modulation is a great excitement, and it's beyond the scope of this talk. But be tuned in because this is an area where you can be seeing more and more data that's going to be coming through. So I'll conclude again by highlighting this slide again to address the topic of PDVF stall. Reprogram the device, assess the need for the batch population, use beta blockers and neuron assisted deep sedation, intubate and use of anesthesia, consider a thoracic epidural and stellar ganglion activity, and of course capture addiction in any state that is feasible. So where is the field going? Uh, a window into the future. One of the studies that uh, we have designed uh, at UCLA, and it's going to be an international study uh, involving centers in Italy, Asia, and the US. 
is to actually do prophylactics, uh, symptom thoracic symptectomy, and have look at patients with ICD in this category versus ICD alone. And we are hoping that someday we'll get to a paradigm where we can actually do studies like ablation of a myocardial scar and perhaps cutting off the nerves and hopefully lead to ICD. And so that we have industries sponsor meetings like this to be selling you know, other types of devices and tools so you're in and out of the human body and not residing in the human body and have to deal with long-term cycling. So perhaps this is where the interface of regenerative medicine and electrophysiology will be. I'll stop here and thank all of my colleagues at UCI Management Center and finish up that. Thank you so much.